here to assert that he already has it and that the white man ought recognize this. And this was an effective mechanism, an effective technique. And this is an important technique in the whole method of nonviolence in terms of putting pressure on the white community with the result of changing attitudes. You see, this is essentially what we feel. We feel that this is a moral and a psychological problem as well as a legal problem. Uh, uh, speaking of well, this pressure and speaking of this $20 billion purchasing power, uh, Malcolm, uh, you disagree, as you have stated, uh, with CORE. You disagree on sit-ins. You disagree on the freedom buses. And yet you would picket stores and uh, establish boycotts uh, against white business people. We've never picketed stores. And we've never established boycotts. Well, now, I, now again, I am quoting from this book, which you have the right to contradict. He's absolutely wrong. Uh, well, uh, Muslims have never picketed any stores, nor have we ever practiced any kind of boycott. Do you believe uh, in an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth? Definitely. The, the Bible itself believes in an eye for The white man believes the in Bible an eye. The Bible does not say an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Uh, now, no, it doesn't, We don't, Matt, we don't want to get off into it. No, you. well, let's not, let's not <laughs> yeah, talk don't about don't the Bible. Don't let's get off into it. I'll don't challenge it. Hold that just Bible. one second. I, okay. I know you have it there. <laughs> Eustace, will you come in yes, and settle uh, What I, I want to say to Malcolm is that his analogy between... Uh, 20 million person power of Negroes in the United States and uh, bringing into the question of Norwegian, Sweden, the, and Swedes and so on, all of that is altogether different. The thing that makes it so difficult with us here is that what he says is has a great degree of plausibility. But what he doesn't tell you is, what he doesn't say, is, what he doesn't realize or else doesn't care to bring it to the front is, how is the 20 million or 20 billion dollars made up? From where does it come? How would he get it if he were to... How much of it would he carry with him? How, how much of it would he get? How much of it would he have if he were to follow uh, the Muslim teaching of separation? He wouldn't have much of it. You see, the Norwegians control Norway. The Danes control Denmark. <laughs> Sweden, and their person power, whatever it is, they use it for themselves. We don't control the United States of America, nor its economic... Uh, uh, found yes, this. this goes along with uh, one of the things you said at lunch. May I say at this yes. point, it was a delightful lunch. I wish we'd had a microphone there, <laughs> believe me. But one of the things you said at lunch, uh, that the Negro could not have survived if it had not been for this uh, Christian spirit over the years. Uh, it could have been uh, another Eichmann case, and uh, so that you would not have had the opportunities that you have now if it had not been for this Christian spirit. I know, uh, Malcolm, that you're anxious to get in here now. No, Malcolm, uh, he is looking for... No, uh, I'm not. I'm, 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 uh, are you trying no, to find an no, eye no. for an eye? Well, it's in there. I'll get I know it. it's in there. I, mean, I, I think she will I admit it's in exactly there. I can tell you exactly what it is. But I also not think get you, on that. There's a point that uh, you, Malcolm, you brought out. You didn't ask, but just that, a minute, Malcolm. You didn't answer Mr. Gay's question, and I think that this is a very good question. How can I answer it when you cut me off? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Malcolm. When you mention this black bourgeoisie, uh, situate a book that uh, Dr. Frazier wrote uh, and the failure of the, that type of Negro to be successful uh, by using the economic enterprises, what you failed to uh, point out was all, in the past all of these uh, efforts made on the part of the Negroes in this country was without land. When you have some land, then you have something to go on. Land is the basis of all uh, economic independence or economic stability or economic security. Land is the most important thing, and this is the number one thing that the black people in America have never had since we were kidnapped from Africa and brought here to, make, to be made slaves uh, by the white man. And, and when you come and when you tell me that uh, uh, that there are twenty uh, billion dollars, yes, it is in the hands of many Negroes, but the upper class or middle class Negro, there's no such thing as upper class Negro, who has the control of this wealth, instead of using it like the white man has done to establish businesses and factories and industries for his kind, the black people who have this wealth spend that wealth imitating the white man rather than establishing businesses and factories, factories and other type of industry. You have immigrants in this country, right here in Philadelphia, who haven't been here 50 years and, have come, and who came here poor. Yet they have gone downtown here in Philadelphia and set up stores with their names on them. And when their children come out of school, their children have jobs in which to work. They have set up factories with their name on them. They, and when, and uh, their children have jobs when they come out. Now, Negro, you and I, our forefathers, have been here 400 years. We have been up from so-called slavery since the emancipation, 100 years. And, and, uh, and, and as the uh, New York Times 
brought out. We control $20 billion a year, and yet you can't point in any direction and look at factories that are being set up by these wealthy Negroes. All they're doing is taking that money and, and forcing the white man to sell him a house uh, in, in, in the white neighborhood to try and imitate the uh, social life of the white man. They're trying to uh, escape from being a Negro. They're trying to escape from being black. They're trying to escape from what they were born as, and they're using what uh, they do have instead of to uplift their people, to, to force themselves upon white people and live among white people. I disagree with you on two instances. And on that integrated First, lunch counters that you pointed out as a step forward, you should be ashamed of yourself because anytime you have 20 million black people in this country who contributed 310 years of slave labor to make the uh, economic system of America as strong as it is, to think that the black masses whose ancestors made this contribution of sweat and blood, even in the war, to make America what it is, do you think that they would be satisfied today just to sit down at a restaurant with a, with a, with a Mississippi white man or, a, or an Alabama white man a, a, as a just compensation for these 310 years of, of, of slave labor? Why, it's insane. And I'm not, I'm Mrs. not, Rich? I disagree with Malcolm in several instances. First of all, I challenge the statement that land is the basis of our economic system. Now, I certainly would not say that it is not an important factor in our economic system. It is. But it is not the factor on which our economic system rests. And I think most students of economics are aware of this. Secondly, I want to comment on Malcolm's statement that the Negro is rejecting himself as a Negro. This is not true. I it's think that, that the middle class Negro is rejecting the fact that he is a Negro. This is not true. I think that the sit-in movement, I think that the Freedom Riders, I think all of these uh, point out graphically the assertion of the Negro as a person and as a Negro. I am a Negro and I am a Negro American. Uh, and this is important, and I think that many other Negroes feel this way. The Negro third point that I want to make, and I think this is important, is that the fight for integrated lunch counters is much more than the fight to sit down and drink a glass of water with a white Southern segregationist. It's an assertion of one's equality and human dignity, and it's merely a statement saying, I will go where I please and I will do what I will in this country which is supposed to be free. I think that the sit-in movement, the Freedom Riders, indicate the intense desire of the American Negro to redeem the Constitution. And I think this kind of constructive action in the local community is one of the most effective ways of realizing this goal in the very near future. Our guests on the talk of Philadelphia, Mrs. Evelyn Rich of CORE, regional representative of the Northeast uh, section of the United States for the Congress of Racial Equality, Mr. Malcolm X, who is a leader in the Muslim movement, and sitting in as guest host, Mr. Eustace Gay, former editor, now treasurer and business manager of the Philadelphia Tribune. Malcolm X, I know there are many people wondering, as, as I have uh, from the first time I heard your name, why the X? <laughs> Uh, well, Mr. Harvey, if a Chinese walked in the door and said his name was Patrick Murphy, you'd know that somewhere along the line he must have met with foul play, because Ch uh, and Patrick Murphy is an Irish name, an Irishman is a white man, and anybody with intelligence knows that a yellow man has no business with a white man's name, and if it's absurd for a yellow man to have a white man's name, it's that much more absurd for 20 million black people to walk around here in America with the white man's name. And Mr. Muhammad teaches us that back during slavery, if there was a white man named Smith and he had 50 slaves, every, every slave on that plantation would be named Smith. And if the, uh, uh, a slave's own uh, mother could, or, or brother could be on a, f a plantation across the field owned by Mr. Jones, but his last name would be Jones. The last name of the white man actually denoted on the Negro whose property he was. And we who follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad here in America, when we come into the knowledge of Islam and, and accept or go back to our original culture, the Islamic culture, we completely reject the uh, last name of the white man. And since we don't know the uh, surnames that our people had when they came to this country, uh, we used an X. And that X uh, will stand, as we're taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, until God comes at the end of the world and gives us a name out of his own mouth. I understand that Elijah Muhammad has given you another name, however. 
Shabazz? Shabazz. Uh, yes. He can, give us, he can give all of his laborers' names. But the reason that I don't use the name Shabazz publicly uh, is so that people, just like you just did, will ask me why do I use the name X, and then I can explain it, because most Negroes actually today who come out of college graduate from college with a diploma and still don't realize that they're walking around here with this slave master's name. And if you don't think a name makes any difference, a man can come here from Africa and can be black as ink and go into Mississippi with the name Abdul Sharif, and uh, uh, they'll, they'll, all of the barriers are let down. But uh, 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 an American so-called Negro can graduate from Harvard and speak with a Harvard accent, have a pocket full of money, and be well-dressed, and he can't go anywhere he wants right here in the city of Philadelphia. Mrs. Rich, do you believe in intermarriage? Yes, I do. Malcolm? If we are anti-anything, we're anti-intermarriage. -inter uh, the, Hon the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that intermarriage will bring about the destruction of both the white race and the black nation. And we're, we are. We're absolutely against inter intermarriage. And we think that most integrationists believe in intermarriage. And we also believe that the ultimate objective of most integrationists actually is not the betterment of the black people of America, but the betterment of their own personal amb ambitions. And if you notice, whenever you find integrationists, usually they are involved themselves in a mixed marriage. Walter White, the former head of the NAACP, after he got prominent, he divorced a black woman, married a white woman. I think James Farmer, the national director of CORE, according to the New York uh, Times uh, newspaper, he divorced a black woman in 1946, and he right now is married to a white woman. And we who follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad don't think that a black man who was married to a white woman can even speak out and lead black people today. You know yourself, sir, if a white man marries a black woman, usually his own people reject him. His mother, his father, his brothers, and his own sisters reject him. And if his own family rejects him, you know that his race itself will never accept him as their spokesman. Well, likewise, with black people. When today, when, a, when black people, the black masses, find a black man who is married to a white woman or a black woman who is married to a black man, the black masses, the majority today, do not accept them as any kind of leader or spokesman because they don't think they can represent us. Well, I, I want to say this, that the figures will show, Malcolm, that in these communities where boys and girls have been going to school for a long number of years in interracial, what we call interracial schools, that the percentage of uh, interracial marriages is so low that it's it even... It negligible. Uh, negligible. And this is an important point, Malcolm, uh, and yeah. I'd like to, to comment on it further. Uh, when I say I believe in intermarriage, I mean that I believe that any two people who decide that they want to get married ought to be able to do so. Now, when you speak out so authoritatively against intermarriage, I must say, very frankly, that you are speaking out against me. I am a black woman and I am married to a white man. I must say that your conclusions do not follow. I certainly have not, quote, improved myself, unquote, as a result of my marriage to a white man. And I would further like to say that none of my black has rubbed, out a, rubbed off on him, at least not to my knowledge. And further, and I think this is important, I do not consider myself a leader of anybody except m myself, me. I am a representative for myself and I am a Negro. I am very much a Negro and I certainly don't reject my do identity. My I am a Negro American. Well, I, mean, I happen I, to be a black American. I so I want person. to say this. Yeah. I'm very much an American. Yeah. I believe in the things which on which our country is founded. And I think this is important because in many senses I think it has been stated quite cogently that if America is to be redeemed and if democracy is to survive and flourish. In many senses, the Negro will play an important role in this. I think this is true. I think that certainly instances during the past year illustrate this. And I think that CORE's basic philosophy rests on this assertion, namely that essentially a human being has certain things which he shares with other human beings. And this essential unity transcends color, national origin, uh, religious feelings. These things are important, and I think that they are meaningful in terms of our whole social fabric. Uh, now, do, one other comment, Ed, before I uh, defer to uh, Mr. Gay or Malcolm, and I think this is important. Many people have suggested that the Freedom Rides, for instance, have hurt American prestige abroad seriously. I do not hold with this view. 
On the contrary, I feel that the instances in Alabama, as tragic as they were initially, have pointed out two things. First of all, the assertion of the Negro, of his dignity and his equality. And secondly, the willingness of the federal government to come to his support, not only legally but morally, on an important legal and moral question. And these things are important within the entire fabric or framework of the discussion we're having here this afternoon. This was Mrs. Rich. Malcolm, if you will answer briefly, I have two more questions to ask, and then we'll go to the phone calls. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I think you'll find, sir, that it's almost impossible today for a uh, black man to marry a white woman and take her into a white neighborhood. The white man won't allow it. I don't care how liberal he is. And uh, there's a growing tendency among black people uh, whereas a black man used to take a white woman into on his arm into a black neighborhood and she'd be accepted there and treated almost like a, a goddess, there's a growing tendency today to reject both of them. And uh, if you'll notice where New York is concerned, where most of these mixed marriages are involved, they they end up in a situation where they can't live in a, uh, an all-white community and they can't live in an all-black community, so usually they end up down in the village. There, there are exceptions, but Usually they end up down in the village of New York where immorality is not one of the uh, yardsticks that you measure, another, or rather morality or high morals is not a yardstick that you measure one another by. Uh, we think that it actually absolutely destroys both the white man as a race and the black people as a nation when this intermarriage takes place. And as I say frankly, we're a thousand percent against intermarriage in any form. It's time for the phone calls. Our guest, Malcolm X. One of the leaders of the Muslim movement, Mrs. Evelyn Rich of CORE, and Mr. Eustace Gay of the Philadelphia Tribune. Our number is Mohawk 7, M O 7 O 500. The opinions heard on the talk of Philadelphia are not necessarily those of WCAU or CBS Radio. Could we have your question or comment, please? Hello, Ed. Uh, I don't feel that Mal Mr. Malcolm's religious philosophy would solve the problems of the human race. Uh, I go along with Mrs. Rich from the core. Now, I am a white person and a half-white. But uh, what I resent is when the uh, Negroes say the white man and their white race are against them for their, uh, for their human rights. Now, I'm just a half-wife, and I'm certainly for their rights. This land of opportunity could afford life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all its inhabitants, regardless of race, creed, or national origin. And I've often wondered, if it was a matter of life or death, would we care whose life-giving blood was injected in our veins, or would we question whose eyes were used to restore our sight? Thank you, and I'll hang up. And well, thank you for calling. Yes, sir. Well, uh, the, the lady who just spoke, she's, she, when she says that America is the land of opportunity, the land of opportunity for whom? You have 20 million black people here who are still relegated to the role of second-class citizens, who are still knocking on the doors of the White House a hundred years since the so-called Emancipation Proclamation, trying to get somebody to pass civil rights and recognize them not as a human being, but as a citizen. And the Muslims are not looking for any white people to accept us or recognize us as citizens. We feel that's putting the uh, uh, cart before the horse. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that until the white man realizes that the black man is a human being, you will never get any civil rights legislation or anything else that uh, will make the, that is uh, designed to make black people recognize her as equals or anything else. So we don't try for citizenship. What we're striving for is human rights. And to, to get these human rights, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad insists upon complete moral reformation among our people. And when that is brought about, automatically our status is elevated. First of all, the fight for civil rights is a fight which is waged not only in the legislative halls of Congress or by executive order of the President. This fight also includes the active personal sacrifices of the American, the white American as well as the Negro American. And I think, for instance, that James Peck's uh, uh, staunch devotion to the principles of nonviolence when he was attacked at that, by that mob in Birmingham illustrates vividly the fact that the white person in America, many of them are willing to make personal sacrifices of a high level. I think that, and this is my second comment, and this, I think, is extremely important, that 
It is Kaur's goal not to humiliate the white man, not to defeat him, not to sentence him to death, but rather to convert him, to give him an opportunity to have his attitudes challenged and his opinions changed so that he can come into the arena with us and work out a solution to this problem quickly and efficiently and now. This is extremely important. Let's get on with the phone call, shall we? Yes. Uh, right. um, I would like to just one little short thing, sir. It's All very right. important. I think where Miss uh, uh, Rich misses the boat, so to speak, being married to a white man herself, automatically it puts her out of touch, so to speak, with the real feelings of the masses of our people here in America who actually don't have enough patience left to give the white man sufficient time to be converted or to be changed. Well, I'm and You in are touch. one of these people who do not have the patience. Sir? You are one of these people who... Not only am I one, but I think I reflect the thinking and the feelings of the masses who uh, are absolutely fed up or who don't think that there's time enough left for, uh, for the white man to be converted or changed. And we're not trying to change him, we're trying to change our people. I am one of these persons too, one of these black Americans who is impatient with the slow change. I am... Uh, an active member in a Negro church. I go to a Negro hairdresser, and I am as, as much in touch with Negro life as is Mr. X, I would like to say. You suggest. should clear up that word Negro before you go too far. Well, we've been into that. The so-called <laughs> Negro, as you call them. Uh, let's take some more of those calls, all right? This is Ed Harvey. Could we have your question or comment? Uh, my comment is that uh, I go along whole Harley with uh, the brother Malcolm there, because any person or any colored person, or I say any African American, I wouldn't say Negro because I do not believe in that myself. I think that any African American who believes, or I, well, I say, who believes that integration is going to solve the problem, I think they are actually playing folly with themselves because total integration will ultimately mean mongrelization, and no white man is going to stand for that. You see, in other words, if you go, if you say that our uh, if you believe that integration is going to solve the thing, I mean, it's, I think it's just playing folly with yourself. And another thing, when he says he speaks for the masses of the people, uh, I believe he's right because when you, uh, a lot of color people are not even aware of the situation that they're in socially. When you go to a psychiatrist, he tells you to lay on the couch and to, and to and dig into yourself and bring out the actual truth. The actual truth is that uh, no, no color man can ultimately be uh, integrated, so to speak, to the fullest, to the absolute extent with white people. I believe they're two different products and separately, or when the white colored man becomes liberated, that's when he will, be, it will excel and, and, uh, and have his dignity. That's what I believe. I don't uh, believe any comment is needed. Uh, I think it's pretty well established that uh, Mrs. Rich is against what you say and the Malcolm X is for what you say. So thank you for that opinion, right, sir. Thank you. thank you for calling. This is Ed Harvey. May we have your brief question or comment? Hello, Ed. My name is Paul. Hey, you've really got something going there today. Thank you.